Welcome to Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library Podcast. My name is Demi Schwartz, a Hufflepuff. My name is Jessica Minecci, a Ravenclaw. It's time to turn on the light because Hogwarts is about to welcome you home. Welcome everybody to episode 9 of Lumos Maxima. We are very excited to be here again and this episode's topic is a special one. So if you haven't done so already, feel free to follow us on social media. Our Instagram and Twitter handles are at Lumos Maxima cast and our Facebook page is Lumos Maxima the Rolling Library Podcast. We also have a YouTube channel, which is Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library podcast, where we post bonus content. So please subscribe if you haven't already. We have a voicemail line, which is 412-228-5435. So if you have any thoughts about the podcast, please leave us a voicemail. And speaking of voicemails, we have another one from our friend Maddie. She commented about episode 7, which was all about Thestrals. Let's hear it. Well, it's me again, your number one fan. I was just sitting here thinking about y'all's episode you released Friday. And I was just curious, what do y'all think about the Thestrals being drawn to death? I was thinking, I know that they're a symbol of death, but what if they're attracted to it? So, like, that's why when they were going to the ministry, they showed up because they knew that Sirius was going to be killed. And then when they were uh, taking Harry back from his house in Deathly Hallows, they knew that Mad-Eye was going to be killed and Hedwig. So that's why there were two Thestrals there. I don't know. I'm just thinking. And then also in the Battle of Hogwarts, the Thestrals were around and people died from there as well. Thank you so much, Maddie. I absolutely love your perspective on this because, you know, as you mentioned, the Thestrals can be drawn to death and we see three very specific parts in the book where this happens. So I absolutely love how you brought this up. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, this was a really different perspective than what we originally thought, but I really like it. And I think it's super cool, especially because these are my favorite magical creatures. Yeah, I really like how Jess brought up how, like, you have a different perspective because this is all about interpretation. And especially with these creatures that are so symbolic and so unique, there's obviously going to be different opinions and different point of views. So I absolutely love that. And now, Jess, do you want to tell everybody our topic for episode nine? Yeah, our topic is Summer at the Burrow. Harry spends a lot of his summers at the Weasleys' home, and since it is one of my favorite places in the Wizarding World, we've decided to discuss it in this episode. And with that, let's get into our Summer at the Burrow quote. It's time for Quick Quotes Corner. This episode's quote comes from Chapter 4 of Chamber of Secrets called At Flourish and Blots. What Harry found most unusual about life at Ron's, however, wasn't the talking mirror or the clanking ghoul. It was the fact that everybody there seemed to like him. Harry grew up in the household of his aunt, uncle, and cousin, a place where he was neither loved nor treated well. In the first book, Harry found a home at Hogwarts. However, it wasn't until the second book that Harry learned about what a home should contain, a group of people who love each other and treat each other with respect and kindness. In being shown that love, Harry finally got the home that he needed and deserved with the Weasleys. Harry grows up with everyone at the borough also and learns all about the wizarding world through his new family. Yeah, I think it's super important that Harry found a wizarding family to be a part of because he didn't grow up with that experience because he lost his parents when he was only a baby. And getting to live with the Weasleys during the summer and become like a son to Molly and a brother to the others is a beautiful thing. And we see throughout the rest of the series, as we're going to talk about later, how their bond just becomes stronger as time goes on. Hey guys, here comes Pigwidgeon with our news. Oh wait, it's Polly. (laughs) Hey, it's Polly, our owl. She's bringing us the wizarding news in the muggle world. Thank you so much, Polly. Let's get into this news. Are you looking to have a Harry Potter themed makeover and spa day? Alta Beauty has a brand new makeup and bath collection inspired by the stories of Harry Potter and the wizarding world. Let's take a look. 
First up are the Harry Potter bath bombs. These bath bombs are themed to the four Hogwarts houses, and when they hit the water, they transform your bath into a celebration of your Hogwarts house colors. Next is the Harry Potter Bewitching pH Bomb. These magical lip balms are infused with coconut oil, vitamin E, and aloe leaf extract. They react to the pH levels in your skin and create the perfect color shade to complement your tone. The Harry Potter Body Lotions are themed to the four Hogwarts houses and are flavored to match the house traits. Gryffindor's is the bold scent of blackberries. Slytherin's smells like soothing raindrops. Hufflepuff's scent has floral notes. And Ravenclaw's is flavored with cucumbers. Next up is the Hogwarts House Cosmetic Bag. These cosmetic bags capture the traits of the four houses. The Harry Potter Deathly Hallows Brush Kit has brushes that are themed around the Deathly Hallows and will make you the master of makeup. The Hogwarts House themed eyeshadow palettes have different Wizarding World color schemes and the sets are colored around the Hogwarts houses. The Harry Potter House nail polish strips dry in no time at all, just like magic, and you can have nails inspired by your Hogwarts house. The House Pride hair sets throw you back to the 90s with ribbons and velvet scrunchies. Next is the Harry Potter lip gloss. This lip gloss will leave you sparkling. The Lumos Face and Body Shimmer Drops, which are inspired by the Lumos Charm, will give your skin an extra sparkle. The Harry Potter Lip Crayons are magical, lightweight, pigmented lipsticks that have a natural matte finish. The Pygmy Puff Blush Set is inspired by the adorably colored Pygmy Puffs. The Quidditch Sheet Face Masks represent the Hogwarts houses. Gryffindor Masks come infused with bamboo charcoal. Slytherins with aloe vera juice. Hufflepuffs with lime juice. And Ravenclaws with a touch of pomegranate. This fantastic collection is available on Alta's website for U.S. fans and is also available in stores from July 26. Next, we have more readings from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. The one and only Matthew Lewis, along with Helen Howard and Imelda Stanton, read Chapter 12, The Mirror of Erised. Hugh Bonneville reads Chapter 13, Nicholas Flamel. Jason Isaacs, Tom Felton, and Helen McCrory read Chapter 14, Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback, for a Malfoy family reunion. Claudia Kim and Dakota Fanning read Chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest. And Kenneth Branagh and Ruth Wilson, with Helena Bonham Carter, read Chapter 16, Through the Trapped Door. There's only one more chapter to be read, chapter 17, which should be coming very soon. And now, let's head over to Jess with Summer at the Borough News. The borough is located just outside the village of Ottery St. Catchpole. It is speculated that this place is called the borough because rabbits live in burrows, and like rabbits, the Weasleys have many children. Here's how Harry describes the borough. It looked as though it had once been a large stone pig pen, but extra rooms had been added here and there until it was several stories high, and so crooked it looked as though it were held up by magic, which Harry reminded himself it probably was. Four or five chimneys were perched on top of the red roof. A lopsided sign stuck in the ground near the entrance read, The Burrow. Around the front door lay a jumble of rubber boots and a very rusty cauldron. Several fat brown chickens were pecking their way around the yard. The burrow has six bedrooms and six stories. It also has an attic with a rickety uneven staircase separating each story. The garden is located behind the house and is surrounded by a fence, a hedge, and some gnarled trees. At the end of summer, the garden is overgrown and filled with weeds and with grass that needs cutting. Two flutterby bushes were added for Bill and Fleur's wedding. There's also a big green pond full of frogs. Beyond the hedges are fields and hills that lead up to the orchard. The Weasleys also dine out here when they have guests. The orchard is up the hill beyond the garden. The Weasleys use this small paddock to play Quidditch matches. 
The orchard is surrounded by trees and can't be seen by muggles. Bill and Fleur's wedding ceremony and after party was held here underneath a tent. Next to the garden is a run-down, smelly stone outhouse that is now used as a broom shed. Sadly, it's full of spiders. Starting at age six, Ginny went in there to borrow her brother's broomsticks and taught herself Quidditch. In the front yard is a garage that stores the magical flying car that Fred and George use to pick up Harry from Privet Drive. The chickens live in the chicken coop. This is where Mr. Weasley also keeps the leftover flying motorcycle pieces, which he hides from Mrs. Weasley. The kitchen is up the steps from the garden and through the back door. The kitchen is small and cramped with a scrubbed wooden table with eight chairs, a window overlooking the house's front path, and a fireplace with the mantelpiece stacked three deep with cookbooks. Errol's perch is just inside the back door. A long, narrow passageway leads to the staircase and the rest of the house. The scullery is a tiny room off the kitchen. It's most likely used as a laundry room. There's a mangle in the corner of this room. Next, we have the sitting room. The sitting room is described as shabby but cozy, lit by oil lamps. There's a sagging armchair, a comfortable couch, a fireplace, and a large wooden wireless set. A sideboard with fire whiskey and glasses is on one wall. Jenny's room is small and bright. It features posters of the Weird Sisters and the Holy Head Harpies, and a desk that sits in front of the window overlooking the orchard behind the house. This bedroom likely used to be Charlie's. Bill's bedroom is probably located on the first floor. Bill shared this room with Charlie when Charlie came to visit. Going up to the second floor, we have Percy's bedroom. Percy's room has a window overlooking the garden. The twins' bedroom is also on the second floor. The room has a wardrobe, a desk, and a bedside table with a lamp. Boxes of Fred and George's products are lying around, and the room smells like gunpowder when Harry stays there in Half-Blood Prince. Going farther up the stairs, there is most likely a bathroom on the third floor, but there are no bedrooms. It is through this room that Ginny spotted Harry when Harry first came to the burrow. The fourth floor features Mr. and Mrs. Weasley's bedroom. On the fifth floor is the bedroom in the attic, aka Ron's room. Marked by a sign saying Ronald's room, Ron's bedroom has orange hangings of the Chudley Cannons, his favorite Quidditch team. In Chamber of Secrets, there is a tank with frog spawn in it in the room along with Scabbers the Rat. In Goblet of Fire, the room changes. The frog spawn has grown into an actual frog, and instead of scabbers, Pigwidgeon is there in his cage. A small hatch outside Ron's room opens from the ceiling, revealing a ladder to the attic. The ghoul lives in this tiny space nestled beneath the rafters. He also bangs on the pipes during the night. Now, let's dive into our Tales of Magic and Mischief segment where we will talk about some key moments in the series that happen during the summertime at the burrow. Now, it's time to dive into the book topic of the week for Tales of Magic and Mischief. Hey guys, it is time for us to talk about the burrow. The first time Harry sees the burrow is in Chamber of Secrets after Fred and George and Ron rescue Harry in the magical flying car. So they get there, and they're like, okay, let's let's get up to bed before Mrs. Weasley spots us. And of course, Mrs. Weasley is on top of her game. Like, she doesn't let anything pass her, pass her by. Like, she watches like a hawk. I swear, moms have superpowers. So she sees them um, coming into the house, and here's what she says. Beds empty. No note. Car gone. Could have crashed. Out of my mind with worry. Did you care? Never. As long as I've lived, you wait until your father gets home. We never had trouble like this from Bill or Charlie or Percy. This part is seriously iconic, and I love how Molly is like, wait till your father gets home, when Arthur just like is super like stoked about the whole thing and doesn't even care. Yeah, he thinks it's funny. Like, Mrs. Weasley is the one to be afraid of here. Like, <laughs> she acts like Arthur is gonna, like, you know, you know, rain down the wrath. And no, that's Mrs. Weasley. That's hysterical. <laughs> and this is also funny because 
you know, Mrs. Weasley's first instinct is to scold um, the kids. Whereas when she sees Harry, she's like, oh, hello, dear. Like, (laughs) oh, I just noticed you're there. Hello, dear. (laughs) Uh, And so then she invites Harry in for breakfast nicely, whereas everybody else just kind of troops inside. And as their punishment, Mrs. Weasley makes everybody denome the garden. She tells Harry he can go to bed, but he's, like, really intrigued by this. He's like, what does denome mean? Like, I've seen the muggle gnomes, but these must be even more entertaining. So he goes with them. This is what he says about the gnome. It was small and leathery looking with a large knobby bald head, exactly like a potato. It also had horny little feet and sharp teeth. So this is definitely not like a muggle gnome, right? The muggle gnomes look like Santa Clauses, and this one is weird looking. Like, it's de- it's deformed, <laughs> right? It's like a rotten potato, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing about the gnomes, this is so random, but when I was in Cincinnati, for some reason, I don't know if it was for Easter or what, but there were, like, a ton of, like, cute little colorful stuffed gnomes like the muggle kind and I like freaked out and I got one and mine's like pink and it's super cute and now I'm like I have one of the burrow's gnomes even though it's nothing like it but I pretend that it came from the burrow (laughs) (laughs) so random all right so speaking of denoming I would love to do this because the boys teach Harry that in order to denome the garden you actually have to pick up these gnomes spin them around and then throw them across the over the hedge Also, the creatures are really dumb because once the denoming starts, they actually come over and are like, ooh, what's going on? And and then they just get thrown over the hedge, which is just like really stupid. It's really funny. So Ron throws his gnome 20 feet over the hedge and Fred says this. Pitiful, said Fred. I bet I can get mine beyond that stump. So then when the denoming is finished, this is when Mr. Weasley comes home. And as Demi said, it's hysterical because he literally asked the boys how the car worked and, like, was it successful? And Mrs. Weasley, like, that's not the point. <laughs> like, that's not the point. They actually flew it in the dead of night and could have been seen. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so that was funny. So one of the highlights of the visit includes Harry seeing Ron's room for the first time. And this is really important because... Harry thinks that this room is awesome, right? It's messy, it's lived in, and it's really cool what with the Quidditch team and the bedspread and all that. But unlike living at the Dursleys, Ron's magical possessions are out and about, and Harry's stuff is usually locked up. So Harry thinks this is like the bomb.com. But Ron is very worried about what Harry will think of it. He's very conscious about how he doesn't have as many amenities as other wizards, and this shows in what he says right here. It's a bit small, said Ron quickly, not like that room you had with the muggles, and I'm right underneath the ghoul in the attic. He's always banging on the pipes and groaning. But Harry, grinning widely, said, this is the best house I've ever been in. Ron's ears went pink. This is so significant because Ron is so self-conscious about his family's financial situation, but Harry grew up in a cupboard under the stairs. So to him, this house is fantastic, as Jess just said. And also, I love how Harry is so accepting of the Weasleys, while at the same time, the Weasleys are so accepting of him. That's a really good point. And, like, think about all of the levels to this house, right? To him, it's like a mansion. It's a crooked-looking mansion with a bunch of really fun things inside. So now Harry discovers a little bit more about what it's like to live in a wizarding household. There's this really cool clock in the kitchen that has one hand and no numbers around its face. And instead it says things like, time to make tea, time to feed the chickens, and you're late. Mrs. Weasley has magic recipe books. She can cook by magic. And she listens to a wireless radio's witching hour with Celestina Warbeck. Also, this is my favorite thing. There's a mirror over the mantelpiece, and it tells Harry to tuck in his shirt. Like we were also saying earlier, the burrow is an awesome place because everybody loves having him there. It's disorganized, there's explosions from Fred and George's room, and everybody is just super hyped that he's there. 
So, Mrs. Weasley fusses over the state of Harry's socks, and she encourages him to eat more. Mr. Weasley has Harry sit next to him at the table and asks him all kinds of questions about life with muggles. So, he wants to know about how plugs and the postal service work, and Harry also explains to him about how to use a telephone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this phrase is so funny because they say it wrong every time they say telephone. When Ron tries to call, he's like screaming because he doesn't know how a telephone works. <laughs> <laughs> so also here we have Ginny who cannot talk to Harry to save her life. And she always keeps dropping things when Harry's around. And then we have Percy who thinks he's like God's gift, basically working <laughs> He's always working all the time in his room, and he, like, never comes out. So then they get the list of Hogwarts books that they need from Lockhart, and then George mentions to Mrs. Weasley that the books are expensive, and um, she says that they'll manage and they'll get all of Ginny's things secondhand since she is coming to Hogwarts this year. So Percy walks in with his prefect badge pinned to his sweater vest, because, again, he's very important, and he actually sits on Errol, which Harry doesn't realize is an owl. He's like, what is that thing? And then he realized it was breathing. (laughs) He's like, oh, my God. Okay, so they get a letter from Hermione. She tells Ron she hopes they didn't do anything illegal to rescue Harry. Whoops. (laughs) And she says she's busy with schoolwork and that she can meet them in Diagon Alley next Wednesday. She also wanted to let them know what was going on with them, and she suggested sending another owl, just because Errol just can't handle the delivery anymore. And then Mrs. Weasley agrees that they can meet her in Diagon Alley. I love how Hermione says she's busy with schoolwork, and Ron's basically like, how could she be? We're on holiday. (laughs) I also love how they say holiday. It's such a British Yeah, We're on holiday. (laughs) It's called a summer vacation in America. (laughs) Or a staycation if you're in quarantine. (laughs) (laughs) This is my favorite part at the burrow in Chamber of Secrets. So Harry, Ron, and the twins go up the hill to the paddock, which is surrounded by trees, to play Quidditch. While they're there, they have to fly low so that the villagers don't see them, and they also have to use apples as Quidditch balls because if something else flew over the village, those people are going to be like, what just happened? They also take turns riding Harry's Nimbus 2000. Percy declines their invitation to join them in their Quidditch game, and Fred says he wishes he knew what Percy was up to because Percy had already received 12 OWLs and so had Bill. Um, And then George says... If we're not careful, we could have another head boy in the family. I don't think I could stand the shame. And Percy does become head boy, so poor George. And as they always call him, perfect Percy. So after this, George worries a little bit about how they're going to afford all of this stuff again for them at Hogwarts. And Harry kind of feels bad. You know, he's like, I have this small fortune in my, you know, vault. And he's like, I wish I could share it with them, but he knows that that would be a little bit insulting um, just because they work so hard for what they have. So it just shows again how Harry really has come to like the Weasleys and how he would do anything for them. So the summer ends with Harry going to Diagon Alley using flu powder, and we all know how that goes. Then they come back and they have a scrumptious feast with treacle pudding and they have mugs of hot chocolate. Also, Fred and George set off some filibuster fireworks. The next day, they go to King's Cross, and this is what it looks like in the Weasley house on the morning that they have to go back to school. They were up at dawn, but somehow they still seemed to have a great deal to do. Mrs. Weasley dashed about in a bad mood, looking for spare socks and quills. People kept colliding on the stairs, half-dressed with bits of toast in their hands, and Mr. Weasley nearly broke his neck, tripping over a stray chicken as he crossed the yard carrying Ginny's trunk to the car. That literally reminds me of me and my family when we wake up super early to go to the airport for vacation because we always pack the day before, but somehow in the morning we're still like forgetting things and can't find stuff, so I truly feel. Yeah, me too. That's literally me to a T. So this is a typical household moment, and I love it so much. It just makes me feel like I'm there with them. But now, let's talk about Harry's summer 
in Goblet of Fire. Goblet of Fire starts off when Harry is invited to the Quidditch World Cup by the Weasleys. Mr. Weasley got tickets from his contacts at the ministry, and also, in order to get Harry, he used his contacts at the ministry to connect the Dursleys' house to the flu network. However, this doesn't really work out very well because they have an electric fireplace, and so it's boarded up. So, when they get there, they're literally behind the boards, and they can't get through. So, Harry explains the whole electric thing to Mr. Weasley, and this is really funny what he says. So he says, eclectic, you say? With a plug? Gracious, I must see that. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Weasley ends up blasting it open so they can get through to the Dursley's, like, literal horror. So behind Mr. Weasley is Ron and the twins, and they come into the living room. So Fred and George go get Harry's trunk, and Mr. Weasley scares the Dursley's just by the way he talks. So he says how nice the living room looks, even though there's like plaster and boards everywhere. And then he also talks about how he likes plugs. <laughs> so that scares them. And then he asks Dudley about his holiday. Dudley whimpered. Harry saw his hands tighten still harder over his massive backside. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably afraid to get the tail again. You know, the pig tail that Hagrid did. Yeah. He's like, but... I'm going to get cursed again. <laughs> I would feel bad for him, but I no. don't. <laughs> this is an iconic scene because Mr. Weasley just conjures up a fire out of nowhere. And he drops um, flu powder into it. And this is when Fred drops the bag of ton tongue toffees. And then, you know... Fred and George and Ron leave. Harry says bye to the Dursleys. Mr. Weasley reprimands Uncle Vernon for not saying goodbye back, and when Uncle Vernon looks at Mr. Weasley's wand, he actually just says goodbye because he's really scared of getting cursed. Then, to everyone's massive amusement, Dudley's tongue swells up. So, Mr. Weasley tries to help, and he explains the engorgement charm. I also love how Aunt Petunia pulls on Dudley's tongue as if she can just, like, break the curse by like pulling it so aunt petunia covers dudley with her body even though mr weasley is trying to help uncle vernon gets angry and he starts throwing ornaments at mr weasley so harry leaves because mr weasley tells him to and also because he doesn't want to get hit by ornaments so here's what happens his last fleeting glimpse of the living room was of Mr. Weasley blasting a third ornament out of Uncle Vernon's hand with his wand, Aunt Petunia screaming and lying on top of Dudley, and Dudley's tongue lolling around like a great slimy python. When Harry comes through the fire, Fred and George explain to Harry what it was, and they start laughing about how big Dudley's tongue got. Then Harry meets Bill and Charlie, and Mr. Weasley apparates back in and starts scolding them. Fred says, I didn't give him anything, said Fred with another evil grin. I just dropped it. It was his fault he went and ate it. I never told him to. <laughs> <laughs> then Mrs. Weasley comes in and learns about what the twins did, so she starts yelling at them. Hermione and Ginny come into the kitchen, and Hermione subtly tells Ron that he should show Harry where he's sleeping, basically so they can get out of this mess. So they troop up the stairs, and Ron tells Harry that Mrs. Weasley found Weasley's Wizard Wheezes order forms in Fred and George's room when she was cleaning it. Great long price list with stuff they've invented. Joke stuff, you know. Fake wands and trick sweets. Loads of stuff, Ron explains. Also, Mrs. Weasley realized that all this stuff was dangerous that they were creating, so she burns the order forms and she's really upset with the twins because they didn't get that many OWLs and she wants them to work with the ministry like Mr. Weasley, but obviously they have other plans. This is also foreshadowing to the end of the book when Harry gives the twins his Triwizard winnings to open the joke shop. They pass Percy's room, and he's working on his Cauldron Bottom report for the Department of International Magical Cooperation. That'll change the world, that report will, said Ron. Front page of the Daily Prophet, I expect. Cauldron leaks. <laughs> Percy, like, 
blushes and he says that there needs to be a law against these because the products could potentially become dangerous yeah yeah all right said ron and he started off upstairs again percy slammed his bedroom door shut percy is so ambitious it's ridiculous there's more important you know, things whatever just like last time they go up to ron's room which changes as everybody grows up the frog tank that harry notices in chamber now has a frog in it instead of frog spawn Instead of Scabbers being there, the tiny owl is in its cage that Ron got from Sirius, and they learn that Ginny named it Pigwidgeon, which in my opinion is a dumb name. <laughs> I think it's dumb. <laughs> like, he's little. Oh my god, to me, I just got it! It's irony! Because you, know you know how pigs are fat? Yeah. Pigwidgeon is small. It's ironic. <laughs> so they continue making fun of Percy which is to be expected, and Ron's saying, don't put him on the subject of, a, of his boss. He's always talking about his boss. And Ron says, they'll be announcing their engagement any day now. Said <laughs> and so they're sitting there, and they notice that Ron's room is also really stuffed to the brim with beds because fred and george are sleeping there ron's sleeping there harry's sleeping there all because bill and charlie have to stay in the twins room because percy can't share because he's working <laughs> make percy go sleep outside with the gnomes <laughs> so also hermione asks harry about his summer and they almost drop the ball with sirius here because ron asks about if Harry has heard from, and then Hermione shoots Ron a look and is like, don't say anything. Jenny's here. She doesn't even, like, know about Sirius. So then the argument dies down. They go downstairs to help out with supper. This part is hilarious because Mrs. Weasley is actually angry cooking. The potatoes fly out of their skins, and they have to be picked up by a dustpan before the knives shoot out of the drawer and they narrowly miss Ron and Harry and then they start cutting the potatoes. Talk about dangerous. Like cooking with magic, you got knives flying around. Jeez. Gonna take someone's head off. I know, she's kind of scary when she's angry and then she's got yeah. knives. Like, who, who gave her knives? <laughs> who gave her knives? <laughs> then she picks up one of the fake wands that turns into a rubber mouse. And she's so <laughs> mad. She's grumbling the whole time. And it's dangerous. So they skedaddle out of there before they actually get hurt. So just like last time at the burrow, they see the gnomes. Because when they go outside, they see Crookshanks chasing the gnome. He is, like, really interested in these things because he's never seen them before because he lived in a muggle house. Then here's the whole table duel that happens. Bill and Charlie both had their wands out and were making two battered old tables fly high above the lawn, smashing into each other, each attempting to knock the others out of the air. Bill's table caught Charlie's with a huge bang and knocked one of its legs off. The twins are cheering, Ginny's laughing, and her minery is hovering nearby. She's torn between being amused and being anxious about what's going to happen. And then here's Percy... He's yelling to keep it down, and Bill asks about the, how the cauldron bottoms are coming on. Very badly, said Percy peevishly, and he slammed the window shut. So then they stop goofing around, and they actually finish setting up the table for dinner. When you read this dinner, you actually feel like you're part of the family, because there's tons of conversations going on at once between different groups of people. So Percy is going on about his work at the ministry with Mr. Weasley. He's talking about his report, he's talking about arrangements for the cup and how he doesn't like Ludo, and then he's talking about Bertha Jorkins being missing and about the arrangements at Hogwarts, which we all know will end up being the Triwizard Tournament. Then Mrs. Weasley is fussing about Bill's earring and his long hair, and everyone else is talking about the World Cup. As the dinner winds down, the trio talk about Harry's correspondence with Sirius, but Harry neglects to tell them about his scar hurting. He's too happy at this point in time to really get into that. Then, Mrs. Weasley says that they all have to go to bed because they'll be up at dawn tomorrow for the World Cup, and last time, the match lasted five days, so Mrs. Weasley is going to stay behind and get everyone's stuff for school. Percy shudders at being away from work for five whole days. Yeah, someone might slip dragon dung in it again, eh, Purse? said Fred. 
That was a sample of fertilizer from Norway, said Percy, going very red in the face. It was nothing personal. It was, Fred whispered to Harry as they got up from the table. We sent it. (laughs) (laughs) I love the twins. Twins are the best part of this entire ordeal. And, like, you see this whole sibling wi- rivalry, right? Harry never had siblings, yeah. so he gets to tease them, and they get to tease him back, which is, like, super important about life at the borough. Mm-hmm. It's so funny. And also, this wizarding household teaches Harry, like we said, about what it's like to be a wizard. So before they leave for the cup, Harry learns that since Percy, Charlie, and Bill are old enough... They pass their apparition test and they can apparate, so they don't have to wake up early, to the disappointment of everybody else, because they have to wake up early. Charlie had to take the test twice, said Fred, grinning. He failed the first time, apparated five miles south of where he meant to, right on top of some poor old deer doing her shopping, remember? <laughs> and, oh my gosh. And then they learned that um, you have to be registered to apparate. And these people that Mr. Weasley saw at the ministry, they weren't, and they actually splinched themselves. And Muggles actually saw the half of themselves that were in one place and in another. What would you do if you saw, like, an apparition gone wrong? I don't know. Like, as a Muggle, I'd panic. (laughs) But if I was Fred and George, I'd laugh. (laughs) Like, I don't know. What would you do? Um, as a muggle, I'd probably, like, call 911 and be like, this person's half of their bodies on the road, help. <laughs> <laughs> but if I was a wizard, I'd probably just be like, oops, someone did it again. Oops, yeah. someone I did it did again. It. <laughs> <laughs> then this part is kind of sad for the twins because Mrs. Weasley notices something in George's pocket and she actually accios all of this toffee that she told them to throw out and she's angry so the twins leave and they're not happy at all because apparently it took six months to develop this. So then Harry learns about what a port key is and he takes the moldy boot to the the site where they have to go camping and then the dark mark incident happens so everybody returns to the burrow afterwards kind of scared mrs weasley is worried sick about everyone then she apologizes to the twins for shouting at them before they left percy and mr weasley start working long hours at the ministry the summer ends with mr weasley leaving to fix the dustbin incident with moody and harry learning about who moody is and what an aura is Then they set off in muggle taxis in the rain toward King's Cross. This is also the part of the book where Harry sees the clock at the Weasleys that has the names of the Weasleys on it. And then it says, I think it says work, home, traveling, and then mortal peril. I know that's one of them. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, so there's a bunch of them there. Which is really cool. I'd like to be able to keep tabs on my family with a magical clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. I wonder where she got it. I don't know. They never say. That's Capital Fire, which is really kind of cool. It's like, you know, you see a happy-go-lucky household in the beginning to a little bit more cautious as Voldemort is rising, but still you see the love in all of these family members and of Harry and Hermione who are just really ecstatic to be there yeah and like the first two books that we see harry at the burrow chamber and goblet a lot of it is super lighthearted. you mentioned a lot of super funny parts and when we get into hapwood prince now we see like when he's there in hapwood and then definitely hell is at the end it's very serious and there's a shift in the mood at the burrow so we're gonna get into that In Half-Blood Prince, after Harry and Dumbledore go to see Slughorn, Dumbledore takes Harry back to the burrow to spend the rest of his summer holiday. When he gets there, this is what the book says. He was standing in a country lane beside Dumbledore and looking ahead to the crooked silhouette of his second favorite building in the world, the burrow. In spite of the feeling of dread that had just swept through him, his spirits could not help but lift at the sight of it. Ron was in there. And so was Mrs. Weasley, who could cook better than anyone he knew. 
This is very significant because Harry sees the burrow as his second favorite place after Hogwarts, and it's a place where he can have a family, unlike the Dursleys, who never treated him like family. Also, during this little part, Harry thinks of two very important people, Molly, who was like a mother to him, and Ron, his best friend, who was also like a brother. And also, he thinks about Molly's fabulous cooking, because at the Dursleys, we know that they pretty much starved him. So, the burrow is literally such a special place. There are many places that you can call home, right? Your actual house, your school, but having a friend's house that you can call home is really special. Before Harry goes into the house, Dumbledore takes him into the Weasley's broom shed for a little chat. So he first tells Harry that he's pleased and a little proud of him for how he's been handling everything since the ministry, and he also tells him that Sirius would have been proud of him. So this is a very deep conversation to be having in a broom shed with a bunch of spiders. Then Dumbledore tells Harry that he is the chosen one, and he tells him to share the prophecy with Ron and Hermione. He also tells Harry that he wants to give him private lessons that year, which we know are the pensive trips to find out about Voldemort's past and the Horcruxes. And to Harry's delight, Dumbledore tells him that he no longer has to do Occlumency with Snape. That is arguably the best part of that conversation. <laughs> Definitely is. So this conversation wraps up first by Dumbledore telling Harry that the OWL results should be coming later that day. He also tells Harry to take his invisibility cloak with him wherever he goes. And finally, while Harry is staying at the burrow, the house has been given high security that the ministry could provide, and this causes a bit of an inconvenience for Molly and Arthur because their post is being searched before it's taken to the house, but they don't really care because Harry's safety is most important. And Dumbledore basically ends by telling Harry that he shouldn't do anything stupid while he's staying with them because that would be a poor way to respect them for what they're doing for him. So finally, Harry goes into the house and it's pretty tense because Molly wasn't expecting Harry to come until morning. So she's a little nervous and also Tonks is there and she's not really her bubbly, cheerful self. She's feeling super down and she leaves when Dumbledore gets there. And then Dumbledore also leaves. So this is super awkward. But obviously we know Tonks is feeling guilty about Sirius' death. And also there's some things going on with Lupin that we don't know yet. But after Dumbledore and Tonks are gone, Molly pulls the best mom move, sits him down, and gives him onion soup and bread. Harry and Molly have a little conversation about Slughorn. Molly tells Harry that she doesn't like him much because of his whole collecting people thing, which, agree, that's just straight up creepy. Um, but then she gets super happy because she tells Harry that Arthur has been promoted. Arthur is now heading the Office for the Detection and Confiscation of Counterfeit Defensive Spells and Protective Objects. Too many words! They could have just called it the office to protect against you know who. That would have been much simpler. Yeah, but I mean, it's really exciting for him. I mean, he got promoted and the man works so hard. Like, he deserves this. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. So now Molly is a little anxious because Arthur isn't back from work yet. And she looks at her clock that we talked about earlier. And Arthur's hand is pointing at mortal peril as well as all the other hands since, you know, Voldemort came back. Um, that's where all the hands have been pointed. So she's super nervous, but then she gets relieved because Arthur's hand switches to traveling and that's when he's operating home. Molly goes over to the door and asks if it's Arthur, but he said that he'd say that even if he was a Death Eater. So she has to ask him the question and her question to him is, what is your dearest ambition? And Arthur's dearest ambition is to find out how airplanes stay up. Classic Arthur Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not magic that they stay up with. So Molly's like, okay, and then she goes to open the door, but Arthur's holding it shut because he has to ask her his question. And at this point, Molly's like, this is silly. Like, well, come on, let's go. And Arthur is like not dropping it. So he asks her, what do you like me to call you when we're alone together? And Molly says, Molly Wobbles, which is so cute. <laughs> it's so cute, but she's totally embarrassed. And like Harry's like 
eating his soup but like trying not to like look like he's paying attention to the conversation because he's getting embarrassed too it's just great this is a total moment too where it's like they're like harry's pseudo parents basically so it's like when you see your parents doing something like like semi-romantic you like start yeah. gagging or laughing <laughs> and he's like trying not to do that That's fantastic oh man so Arthur comes in, he shakes Harry's hand, Molly being the best, gives Arthur soup too, and Arthur talks a little bit about how rough work was, but then Harry gets super tired, so Molly sends him up to bed. The next morning, Ron and Hermione come barging in because that's what they do. So Harry is staying in the twins' room, by the way, which... This is the twins' room, so it basically looks like a warehouse and has a bunch of their joke shop merchandise all over the place. So Harry starts to tell his friends about Dumbledore and Slughorn, and Ron and Hermione are doing that classic thing where, like, they keep looking at each other, like, all meaningfully because they kind of want to bring up Sirius in the ministry, but then they don't want to, so Harry's totally picking up on the fact that they keep, like, shooting themselves looks. Um, so it's awkward. So now is, like, the best part in Half-Blood Prince. So Ginny comes marching in, complaining about Fleur, but we don't know it's Fleur right away because Ginny just refers to her as she. And so at first, Harry thinks that Ginny is talking about Mrs. Weasley, and it gets super hilarious based on what everybody's saying. So Ginny says that she's driving her mad and talks to her like she's about three. Then Hermione says... She's so full of herself. Ron says, can't she too lay off her for five seconds? So Harry's basically sitting there like, why are they talking about Mrs. Weezy like this? It gets even better because then Jenny says, oh, that's right, defend her. We all know you can't get enough of her. Which Harry at this point is like, she would not be saying that about Mrs. Weezy. Like, this is super weird. Something is going on. I'd be confused too. I'd be like, why are they talking about their mom like that? <laughs> yeah, that was, like, super weird. The first time I read it, I was like, what is going on? <laughs> so when Harry's about to ask them who they're talking about, Flora comes in with his breakfast tray. She puts it across his knees, kisses him on both cheeks, and says that she's super excited to see him and that her sister Gabrielle has not stopped talking about him. Molly also comes in after her, looking not super thrilled because she was going to bring up the tray anyways. And then Fleur spills some major tea when she says that she and Bill are getting married next summer. I would just be so flustered at this point because, like, one, there's just, like, this pretty girl coming into the room, right? And Harry's not dressed or looking nice or whatever, and he's just so dumbstruck, one, by how pretty she is, and two, by what she's saying because no one bothered to tell him, so he's just kind of like, uh, congratulations. <laughs> like... I didn't know. <laughs> so Fleur gets into her um, praising Bill mode and says that Bill is very... I'm not even going to try to do a French accent. Forget that. All right. Bill is very busy at the moment, and she is working part-time at Gringotts to work on her English, so she's staying with the family to get to know them. I wish I could do a French accent. That'd be great. Uh, I can do my Snape voice, but not a Fleur voice. I have to work on that. Then Fleur takes a major dig at the Weasleys because she says there's nothing really to do at the house unless you like cooking and chickens. Which, shut up! Okay, no one likes you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, like, it's so fun, you know? And, like, we talked about how she's scared of brooms in our Thestrals episode. So it's like, she's not going to play Quidditch. And she's not going to, like, enjoy denoming the garden because she's too, like, pretty and perfect, you know? <laughs> so it's just, like, that's her fault that she doesn't like it there. So after Fleur leaves, Jenny tells the others that Molly hates her. And Molly's like, no, I don't hate her. I just think that she and Belle rushed into this. And classic Ron is like, but they've known each other for years. Like, totally fine. <laughs> and Molly's basically like, it's because you know who's back. Everybody's rushing on things that they would normally take the time on and jenny is basically calling molly a hypocrite because she's like well you did that like last time when voldemort was at his heights like you and dad did the same thing and molly's like yeah well we were obviously made for each other so it's fine <laughs> <laughs> well it's super accurate 
I mean, that makes sense. I mean, Floor is very stuck up and kind of like prissy about everything. And Bill is just kind of chill about everything. And so they're total opposites. So it's kind of weird that they're together, but maybe they just are a pretty couple. Yeah, and speaking of that, this is what comes next. So Molly starts speculating over what Bill and Fleur have in common, and she says that Bill is a hardworking and down-to-earth person, and she starts to say what Fleur is when Jenny cuts her off and calls for a cow. (laughs) (laughs) I love Jenny so much. So Jenny disagrees and says that Bill isn't really down to earth because he's a curse breaker and likes adventure and glamour. And this is why she expects that he won for Flem. And can we just take a moment and enjoy the fact that they call her Flem? It's fantastic. That is like my favorite thing with Fleur. It really plays on her French accent and how she can't really speak English, which is kind of rude. But at the same time, she just kind of talks about nonsense. So I guess it makes sense. Also, like, phlegm reminds me of, like, when you sneeze. Yeah. And Fleur is, like, Fleur is always complaining about something. And so it's, like, you don't want to hear the complaining. Yeah. Just, like, you don't want to hear the sneeze or see the phlegm. Yeah. So. Oh, she's so annoying. I know. So after Molly leaves, the group talks about Fleur a little bit more. Jenny says that Molly keeps trying to get Tonk to come around for dinner because I guess she's hoping that Bill will fall for her instead. And Jenny says that she likes Tonks much better. And Hermione says that Tonks is more intelligent because she's an aura. And Harry's like, um, well, you know, Fleur's not stupid because she, like, was it good enough for the Triwizard Tournament? Which, oh, come on, Harry. Come on. She did worse than anybody in the whole tournament. She didn't save her sister. Yeah, exactly. Either. She didn't like... even do that. So Hermione and Ginny scold Harry for his ridiculous input. And Ginny says that she'd much rather have tongues in the family because at least she's a laugh. And Ron says that she hasn't been a laugh lately because every time he's seen her, she looks more like Moaning Myrtle, which shut up, Ron. She just lost her cousin. She blames herself because she was fighting Bellatrix before Sirius. So Tongues feels like if she would have finished Bellatrix off, then she wouldn't have killed Sirius. And also we know later once Harry goes back to Hogwarts and he sees that Tonks' Patronus had changed, we also know that there's some things going on between her and Lupin. So Ron, we all know, has the emotional range of a teaspoon. One more thing about Tonks, which I think is super interesting kind of, is Hermione also mentions that she hasn't been able to change her appearance like she used to. And this can be connected to her depression. I guess, like, if wizards and witches get depressed, it affects their magical abilities. And I think that's super interesting. Yeah, and that makes sense, too, because, like, if you're a werewolf and you're sick and you're weak and you don't take the potion, you turn into a werewolf and are, you know, terrorizing the whole place at the full moon. So... That's kind of a similarity between Lupin and Tonks. Yeah, I really like that connection. So Molly comes back up and asks Ginny to come down and help her with lunch. And after they leave, Hermione is sorting through the twins' boxes and she picks up like this telescope thingy. Um, And then Harry and the others start to talk a little bit more about Dumbledore and everything. And he spills the tea that Dumbledore is going to be giving him private lessons. And Hermione gets super triggered and, like, surprised by this. So she accidentally squeezes the telescope thing and it, like, punches her in the eye. Which, come on, it's that's great. I'm sorry, but Fred and George, they're the best. This is a really blonde moment for Hermione because she's always telling Harry to not touch something or use something <laughs> that, like, could be dangerous. And here she is just, like, with this telescope, like, so what's this do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so hypocritical. It's funny. So they talk a little bit about the prophecy after Harry explains to them that he is the chosen one and everything. And they start to speculate over what the private lessons with Dumbledore are going to be. And then Harry spills some more tea after Hermione starts to wonder what classes she'll be taking because Harry mentions that their OWL results are coming later. So Hermione naturally freaks out. She runs downstairs to see if any of the letters have come with the results from the owls. And Molly tells her that they haven't and then Hermione gets even more freaked out because Molly is like super good with performing you know like basic healing magic and she isn't able to remove the bruise from the punching telescope thing and so Hermione is just not her best. 
Hermione goes on her panic rant about the OWLs. Ron tells her to shut up. Harry asks her what happens if they fail, and Hermione says that she talked to McGonagall about it the year before, and McGonagall said that you basically talk to your head of house to find options, which I don't even know why Hermione's worried about this because she's not going to fail her OWLs. Fleur doesn't help matters here either because she starts talking about how at Bobatones you sit your exams after your sixth year, not your fifth, and she thinks this is better. So she's basically taking a dig at Hogwarts, but nobody's really listening to her because at this moment is when the three owls with Harry, Ron, and Hermione's OWL results start flying to the house and they get super anxious and they open their letters and they find out their results. So I'm going to read their results. So here are Harry's ordinary wizarding level results. He got an acceptable at astronomy, exceeds expectations at care of magical creatures, exceeds expectations at charms, outstanding at defense against the dark arts, which we're not surprised after he organized the whole GA and everything and basically totally slayed at it. He got a poor at divination, exceeds expectations at herbology, exceeds expectations at potions and exceeds expectations at transfiguration. So Harry knew he'd always fail divination. And he also knew that he would fail history of magic because he collapsed in the middle of the exam when he got the tortured vision of Sirius. Harry also gets super sad because he thinks that this is the end of his ambitions to be an Auror because Snape only takes students who got an outstanding OWL on their potions exam. Um, so since Harry got exceeds expectations, he doesn't meet Snape's standards. And this is sad. Um, because he really wanted to be an Auror, and after he learned about the prophecy, he feels that being an Auror will give him the best chance at defeating Voldemort. And also, ever since Crouch, as Moody, put this thought into his head, that's all he could think about as what he wanted to do. But this isn't a bad thing, because we find out that Slughorn is the new potions teacher, and he gratefully and kindly accepts Harry into his class with an E grade on his OWL. What I think is really funny here is that we learn in this book that Snape is the Half-Blood Prince, and we read his potions book so if he had actually taught potions the way that he wrote in the book like people would have had a much easier time in that class harry gets to still pursue his path to be an or so we're happy for him so we find out ron's owl results we find out that he got seven owls he didn't get any outstandings but he did say this which is hilarious only failed divination and history of magic. And who cares about them? Agree. I don't even care about history of magic. The fact that the teacher literally walked out of his body <laughs> and just kept teaching is the weirdest thing ever. Yeah. Like, he was so bored with his subject that he literally died and walked out <laughs> of his body. <laughs> so, Molly is happy with Ron's results because with seven OWLs, that gives him more OWLs than Fred and George had together. Which, honestly, who cares? Because look at them, like, totally kicking butt at their joke shop. So Hermione obviously got 10 OWLs. She got 9 outstandings. And she only got 1 exceeds expectations in defense against the dark arts. I think it's interesting that she got exceeds expectations. Because Hermione really isn't a fighter. So I just don't see her ever going up to outstanding. I think she's better suited to other subjects. She's, like, very book smart. Like, I feel like Charms and, you know, like, her Arithmancy class and Ancient Ruins and all those, like, even potions, too. Like, it's all based on, like, reading theory and, like, doing the spells, like, and casting Charms and stuff. But I feel like defensive magic, it requires more... You, there's, like, more to it. Like, you have to be, like, determined. You have to be braver um to do that and i feel like hermione's not the kind of person to think on her feet and like shoot a defensive spell she's more the person to think things through so that makes sense so the trio feels super excited now because they are officially newt students which stands for nastily exhausting wizarding test which <laughs> wouldn't want to take those <laughs> So over the next couple of weeks, Harry spends a lot of time in the Weasley's garden. 
he plays two aside Quidditch in the orchard with Ron, Hermione, and Jenny, and it's Harry and Hermione against Ron and Jenny. Harry knows that this works out because Jenny is good and Hermione is basically trash, and he spends the evenings having triple servings of all of Mrs. Weasley's food. So, like, it's not like you're going back for seconds. Like, he's going back for triples here. Like, he wants all the food. How does he not gain a bunch of weight in these I don't books? Know. <laughs> like, with all the food he eats. Like, it's, like, this house is literally surrounded by food. And then you go into the movies and stuff and you see all these skinny kids. And I'm like, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> Maybe they have magical metabolism. <laughs> <laughs> I want that. Then I can eat whatever I want. <laughs> So this is when we start to see a little bit of a shift from happier times at the burrow to more darker ones. Because Harry notes that it would have been a better summer if it wasn't for constant stories of disappearances and even deaths in the Daily Prophet daily because of Voldemort's return. And also Molly and Arthur sometimes even bring the news home before it even makes it into the paper. So more bad news comes on Harry's 16th birthday. Lupin shares information that there had been more Dementor attacks, and also they found Igor Kokorov dead in a shack up north with the dark mark over it. More bad news comes because Bill shares that Florian Fortescue, who owned the ice cream shop in Diagon Alley, has been dragged off because his shop shows a sign of a struggle. Arthur also shares that Ollivander is no longer in his shop. By the looks of things, it's unclear if he was kidnapped or just ran off because there is no sign of a struggle. But Lupin says that if the other side has got him, it wouldn't be a good thing because Ollivander is the best wand maker which is a major foreshadowing to when we find out that Voldemort does take him. Yeah, I mean, think about Ollivander. He's a defenseless older gentleman, and he's just being forced against his will later on in the book, and it's just really sad. So the next day, everybody gets their book lists and everything from Hogwarts, and Harry finds out that he has been made Gryffindor Quidditch captain, and Ron grabs a badge and he's looking at it and he's like, I remember when Charlie had one of these. And then he says something absolutely hilarious. Harry, this is so cool. You're my captain. If you want to let me back on the team, I suppose. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so now Molly says that they can't put off a trip to Diagon Alley any longer because they have their book list. So they are going to go on Saturday as long as Arthur doesn't have to work because she wants him to come along because they need security. So the morning that they're leaving to go to Diagon Alley, Bill gives Harry a bag with some gold from his Gringotts vault. And Bill says that the security at Gringotts is ridiculous because it takes like five hours for anybody to get to their vault because of the security. And so <laughs> Fleur, <laughs> Fleur strokes Bill's nose and is like, this is so thoughtful. <laughs> oh my god. I can't with her. She's so weird. Like, her mannerisms are so strange. Jenny pretends to throw up into her cereal. Harry chokes on his cornflakes, and Ron has to thumb him on the back. Pure reactions. So, a Ministry of Magic car is waiting for them in the driveway when they're leaving, and as they pull away, Harry sees Bill and Fleur waving from the kitchen window, which is nice. I mean... Fleur is kind of ridiculous, but at least she's being nice and, you know, seeing them off. Um, but after they get back from their trip, all Harry can think about is Draco, because this is when the whole detour thing happens. They follow him to Nocturne Alley. Harry thinks that Draco is a Death Eater, and Harry, Ron, and Hermione have a conversation in Ron's room, and Harry's basically explaining his theory. The other two are like, dude, relax. He's not a Death Eater. It's fine. Chill. So it's close to the time where they're going back to Hogwarts and Harry is on the way down the stairs with some of his Quidditch robes that are dirty to wash and he passes Ginny and she says to not go into the kitchen because there's a lot of phlegm around. So Harry does go into the kitchen and Fleur is going off about the wedding. She says that Ginny and Gabrielle are going to be her two bridesmaids and she's going to have them wear pale gold because pink would look horrible with Ginny's hair. It's not Ginny's fault that she's a redhead. Come on. I mean, on the one hand, she's trying to be thoughtful, but on the other hand, she's kind of, like, rude. You know, it's just like, well, then pick a different color. I mean, gold? Come on, that's so tacky looking. <laughs> yeah. 
So then Molly tells Harry to make sure that everybody has everything packed so they don't have a total scramble in the morning like they did before that we talked about. Um, so everybody is all ready to go. And as they're leaving, Fleur kisses Harry goodbye. Ron comes forward looking all hopeful, but Jenny sticks out her foot and makes him trip and fall and like at her feet. Ron gets super embarrassed, runs away. And that is the end of the Burrow and Half-Blood Friends. It's just kind of weird. I mean, he's crushing on his brother's philosophy. (laughs) (laughs) I guess you can't blame him because she's part Vila. Yeah, it's so funny, though. Finally, let's move on to Deathly Hallows, my favorite book. We have a lot in this. And as we're going, just keep in mind all of the very important conversations that take place at the burrow that become very important throughout the whole seventh book. So Harry arrives at the burrow after the flight of the seven potters. The whole gathering after everybody gets back to the burrow is very sad because for Harry, Hedwig died, the Mad-Eye also died, and George lost an ear because he was accidentally hit by Snape's Sectum Semper spell. And the group knows that they've been betrayed somehow, which we know the whole thing was set up by Mundungus Fletcher, but the group doesn't know this. Um, But Harry leaves and goes out into the garden and he stops at the gate because his scar is hurting. And he has a vision of Voldemort torturing Ollivander because Voldemort knows about the whole twin core situation. And he was told by Ollivander if he used another's wand that nothing would backfire on him. So he used Lucius's wand and Harry's wand did that thing where it shot golden flames at it and broke his wand. Um, so Voldemort's torturing Ollivander and he sees this. So it's not a great thing. The days following the night of the return is very sad because everybody's so upset over Mad-Eye being dead and Harry just wants to go. Like he just wants to go hunt for Horcruxes. He doesn't want to stay behind anymore. And Ron basically tells him that they can't go anywhere until Harry turns 17. And they also have to stay until Bill and Fleur's wedding, which is the day after Harry's birthday. You really get a sense of urgency here because Harry is seeing Voldemort in action. It was foreshadowed about Ollivander and Half-Blood Prince. And now that it's happening, Harry's like, I can't deal with this. Like, more people are getting hurt the longer I stay here. Um, You know, I need to go. I'm part of this prophecy. But at the same time, it's like you know, he can't. He's stuck. So he has to really exercise patience here and just be in the present moment for a little while. Plus, it's important that he stays for the wedding. He needs to see something happy and something good before he has to focus on all of this death and destruction. You know, like after Mad-Eye died and everything and they had that conversation after everybody got back, like Harry wanted to leave because he was putting them all at risk. And they're all like, dude, like, do you realize what we all just did to get you here? Like, you're not going anywhere. So Harry feels guilty and he feels like, you know, all of this is his fault in a way. So he wants to just get out of there. Even though they can't leave yet, the burrow becomes a very important place for a lot of the planning. And Molly isn't happy about the fact that they're leaving. Um, She keeps pushing them for information, but the trio won't tell her because Dumbledore wanted them to keep it a secret. Also, Lupin and Arthur asked Ron and Hermione. And once they told them that Dumbledore gave them something to do and he didn't want them to talk about it, they dropped it because they know how Dumbledore is. Um, But Molly's not the same, because one day before lunch, Molly starts on Harry and asks him, like, you know, why are you guys dropping out of Hogwarts and abandoning your education? And Harry's like, Dumbledore left us something to do, and Ron and Hermione want to come. Then Molly plays her concerned parent card and is like, well, I think me and Arthur and the Grangers have the right to know. And Harry's like... Well, I mean, like, Ron and Hermione are coming because they want to. I'm not forcing them. It's their choice. So, you know, we're not telling you. Molly tells Harry that she doesn't see why he has to go either. The three of them are barely of age. And the last thing she tries to say is that, well, when Dumbledore told you that there was something that he wanted you to do, maybe you misunderstood. Like, maybe he meant the Order of the Phoenix and stuff. And Harry's like, nope, like, just us. But, like, I love Molly here because she sees Harry as one of her sons. She's concerned about him. She is worried. And like, I don't blame Molly. And I'd be very nervous and scared if I was her. 
and not knowing what they're doing because it's obviously something dangerous and yeah i don't blame her here even though harry might feel angry that he's being questioned at the same time since molly basically raised the three of them pretty much she obviously feels that she has the right to know and as a parent i would feel like i had the right to know if my kid was going into mortal danger yeah and she's not giving in easily because she's keeping the trio so busy with wedding preparations and keeping them apart as much as possible so they can't plan and between the wedding preparations and somber dinners with the order of the phoenix they don't have time to talk until eventually the three of them get away and find themselves in ron's room when harry goes into ron's room hermione is sorting books into two piles ones to take with them and ones to leave behind and ron has the best thing to say Oh, I forgot we'll be hunting down Voldemort in a mobile library. <laughs> Harry tries to reason with them, like, even though they said after Dumbledore's funeral that they would come along. He's basically like, are you guys sure? And they're basically like, yes, we've thought this through. We're coming with you. Hermione has been packing for days. She smuggled all of Mad-Eye's Polyjuice Potion, too, under Molly's nose. And they explain to Harry what they planned and how they prepared to get ready to come with him. Hermione had modified her parents' memories, made them believe that they have different names, they don't have a daughter, and that their life's ambition is to move to Australia, which they've done. And this is all to protect them, to keep them away from Voldemort, so they can't be tortured for information and then ron shows harry what he did so he takes harry up to the attic where the goal is and the goal had been transfigured thanks to arthur fred and george to look like ron with spatagoid and it's wearing ron's pajamas and after ron leaves with harry the goal is going to come live in ron's bedroom because when ron doesn't turn up at hogwarts because he's a pureblood people will be curious of why he didn't come back because he's not in danger and when somebody comes to check it out to see what's going on they will show the ghoul to whoever comes and they won't want to get close to see closer because spatagoid is very contagious so it's very clear that ron and hermione are 100 percent in and they did all they can to protect their families yeah this part is super important because it just shows how loyal harry's friends are to him and the fact that these gryffindors embrace their bravery and are coming with him is just fantastic and again this whole scene at the burrow like you've seen how ron's room has changed throughout all of these books it's changed as he's grown up and now it's changing into i'm an adult now here's my plan to leave and here's what's going to happen so then the conversation turns to where they're going to go after they leave the burrow. And Harry really wants to go to Godric's Hollow, but Hermione says that she doesn't think this is a very good idea. Ron brings up R.A.B., which we know to be Regulus Black, Sirius's brother. They talk about the fake Horcrux, the locket, um, and wonder if the real Horcrux had been destroyed or not. And then Ron asks Hermione, well, how do you even destroy a Horcrux? And this is when Hermione shares that after Dumbledore's funeral, she used Akio to conjure all of the Horcrux books that Dumbledore kept in his office into the girls' dormitory in Gryffindor Tower. So Hermione really did her thinking here. Um, but the whole Horcrux conversation comes to an end when Molly comes in super ticked off and and sends them off to do more things for the wedding. So the burrow has been tidier than ever because of the wedding coming up. Fleur's family comes and it's more crowded than ever. And Molly is still doing everything she can to keep them separated so they can't plan for their trip. Harry spends his 17th birthday at the burrow, and despite the wedding being the next day, the Weasleys, Hermione, and the Delacours do everything they can to make it a special one. They give him gifts, and Jenny gives Harry a pretty special gift in her bedroom until Ron ruins it by barging in. But it's one unforgettable birthday when Molly comes out for the dinner with a snitch cake, which is fantastic. But the mood is totally killed when Scrimger decides to party crash and tell the trio everything that Dumbledore left in his will for them, the Deluminator for Ron, the Tale of the Beetle the Bard for Hermione, and the Snitch for Harry, and he won't give him the Sword of Gryffindor. This whole conversation 
ends pretty heated because Harry disagrees with the way that Scrimger is running everything and they kind of face off a bit, but then Scrimger leaves and yeah, that's Harry's birthday. I've never really liked Scrimger. Like he does a better job than Fudge did because he actually believed in Voldemort coming back and he's trying to defend the ministry but he's also doing a lot of stuff to just make sure that the ministry has a good reputation which I guess makes sense because they want you want to be able to trust the law but the fact that he's always trying to recruit Harry and he's always against Harry because of what Dumbledore wants like it's obvious that Scrimgeour and Fudge were really jealous of Dumbledore's ability to figure things out before they did. So after Scrimgeour leaves and the dinner's over and everything, Harry, Ron, and Hermione go back up to Ron's room and they talk about the things that Dumbledore left them. And I just think it's so interesting in this book how many important conversations happen in the borough, especially Ron's room. Um, they talk about the Horcruxes, they talk about the things Dumbledore left them that turn out to be very important. So it's just very interesting how, like, at the beginning of the series in Chamber, when we first see the burrow, it's this very fun, lighthearted place, and now serious conversations are happening here. So it becomes a very important place in another way, more than just a place Harry can call home. It is wedding time! So the next morning, it's time for the wedding. And Harry is being disguised as one of the Weasley's cousins because they got hair from a muggle boy with red hair and used apologies potion. And they're going to tell everybody that Harry is one of their cousins, which is just hilarious because the Weasleys have so many people in their family that nobody's going to question a cousin. And by the way, his name's Barney, which I just see Barney and I just think of the big purple dinosaur. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. So here's a little description from the book of some of the wedding decorations, which are fantastic. Behind Harry... The entrance to the marquee revealed rows and rows of fragile golden chairs set on either side of a long purple carpet. The supporting poles were entwined with white and gold flowers. Fred and George had fastened an enormous bunch of golden balloons over the exact point where Bill and Fleur would shortly become husband and wife. Outside, butterflies and bees were hovering lazily over the grass and hedgerow. So just picture this. This is so pretty. When I get married, said Fred, tugging at the collar of his own robes, I won't be bothering with any of this nonsense. You can all wear what you like. And I'll put a full body bind curse on mom until it's all over. <laughs> so we also find out that Percy isn't coming for the wedding, which I get that he had a falling out with his dad, but Bill is his brother. Like, that's ridiculous to me, that he won't come for the wedding. Oh, I cannot. I'm sorry, but Percy is my least favorite of the Weasleys. Same. I, I Like, I, I can't imagine not being there for your brother. Yeah, and I feel like this is a big moment that you can look back on at the end of the series after Percy kind of comes around. Um, because, you know, in the battle, he lost Fred, and he's probably feeling guilty now because if he would have gone to the wedding that would have been one more time that he could have made memories with fred and it just shows here how important family is i mean you know they work tirelessly to put this wedding together in their own home you know this is the home where they grew up and they learned about love and now bill is falling in love and he deserves to just have a special day with fleur of course fred and george are all over fleur's villa cousins which is expected um but i also think this wedding is very special because it's almost like this scene is a way to bring a ton of beloved characters throughout the whole series back because Hagrid's there Tunks and lupin are there all the weasleys are there minus percy um luna and her dad are there Victor Crumb comes. So it's just like a way to kind of tie, I feel like, the series together in this beautiful occasion. And we also meet somebody who's not so nice, Auntie Muriel, who is probably like down on my least favorite characters around Umbridge. Like she's like not a good person. 
So let's see what she has to say. First, she goes off about Ron's hair being too long. Then she judges Xenophilia's Lovegood's outfit and says that he looks like an omelet, which is just so rude. How do you look like an omelet? Well, he's dressed in all yellow, but still. No, I mean, seriously, even if you're dressed in yellow, right? How do you look like an omelet? I don't like, know. I'm not going to go up to you if you're in yellow and be like, hey, you look like an omelet. This is the <laughs> weirdest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> then she asked Ron, like, you know, I thought Harry was going to be here. I wanted to meet him. Weren't you guys friends or were you just boasting? And this is hilarious because Harry is literally standing right there and she has no idea. Um, but Ron says that he couldn't come. And this is what Muriel said. Hmm, made an excuse, did he? Not as gormless as he looks in press photographs then. Which, I cannot stand her. Then she turns to Harry, aka Barney, and starts saying how she's been telling Fleur how to wear her tiara because it's goblin made and has been in her family for centuries. And then she takes a dig at Fleur because she says, she's a good looking girl, but still French. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> See, there, there always has to be someone at the wedding who makes it an unpleasant experience. I know. She's just that character that has to be there oh. to make it worse. I know. She keeps going because after this, she tells Ron to find her a good seat because she's 107 and can't stand on her feet long. Which, don't come to the wedding then. No one wants you there. <laughs> <laughs> So Ron takes her to her seat, and then he reunites with Harry and has one of the best little monologues ever. Nightmare, Muriel is. She used to come for Christmas every year. Then, thank God, she took offense because Fred and George set off a dung bomb under her chair at dinner. Dad always says she'll have written them out of her will, like they care. They're going to end up richer than anyone in the family, right there going. Which is totally accurate. <laughs> That is accurate, and honestly, like, I guess that's the way to get rid of people, right? Just shoot off some bomb <laughs> bombs. <laughs> then Hermione joins them, and hears her talking about Muriel, and she says that when she saw her, she said, Oh dear, is this the Muggle-born? And then, bad posture and skinny ankles. Which, why does that even matter? She's Muggle-born. <laughs> That isn't the end of Muriel's insults, though, because then George joins the group with Fred and says that Muriel told him that his ears were lopsided, which is so rude. He literally got it cursed off. What do you want him to do about it? Now, this is when Victor Crumb shows up. Ron is, like, internally thinking, WTF is he doing here? And Hermione's all flustered and everything. And Victor says that Fleur invited him, which is nice. I mean, like, I never really had a problem with Victor. Did you? Yeah, I really like Victor Crumb. He was really polite to everybody at Hogwarts, and he made friends with Harry and Hermione. And I think that he gets a bad rap from Ron because Ron likes Hermione and Victor liked her. But at the same time, he's not a bad character at all. So the wedding starts and it's absolutely magical, except for one Muriel thing she can blurt out, that her tiara set off the whole thing nicely. And she comments that Ginevra's dress is too low cut, which I love how she calls Ginny Ginevra. Like, she calls her by her full name. Like, I never heard anybody call Ginny Ginevra until, like, Muriel came along. Yeah, no wonder she goes by Ginny, because I don't like Ginerva at all. Oh, imagine a whole thing with, like, Minerva and Ginerva. You can do a whole thing with, like, <laughs> McGonagall and Ginny. Like, the two most badass witches in Harry Potter. Oh, my God. The tufty-haired wizard waved his wand high over the heads of Bill and Fleur, and a shower of silver stars fell upon them, spiraling around their now-entwined figures. As Fred and George led a round of applause, the golden balloons overhead burst. Birds of paradise and tiny golden bells flew and floated out of them, adding their songs and chimes to the din. Can I please get married at the burrow? Like, this is what I want my wedding to be. I want it to be at the burrow. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people want to get married at Disneyland, but I think the burrow would be pretty cool to get married at. Way better. Ladies and gentlemen, called the tufty-haired wizard, Will you please stand up? And my mind went right to, may I have your attention, please? Will the real Slim Shady please stand up? I repeat, <laughs> will the real Slim Shady please stand up? <laughs> I just picture the 
the wizard like busting out to the Eminem dance and just like rapping. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh, there was some shit for Santa. So the reception is super dope because the chairs like float and go around white clocked tables and then the dance floor forms out of molten gold and then wizards are going around with silver trays with drinks and food. Iconic. The trio goes to sit with Luna and once a song comes on that she likes, Luna gets up and dances solo on the dance floor, which fantastic. We love her. Um, but once Luna is gone, Victor takes Luna's empty seat and he starts to go off about Xenophilius and he's like, who's a guy in the yellow and everything? And Ron's like, he's the dad of a friend of ours, like, cause he just doesn't like him. Um, and then he asked Hermione to dance. Hermione's super flustered, but pleased about this. And now Harry and Victor are left alone. Um, obviously Victor's not happy about the whole Jeffrey Hallow symbol because he thinks it's a Grindelwald sign. But then Harry has a major brain blast because he's like Gregorovich because he's been having these like visions of Voldemort looking for Gregorovich and like he heard the name before but doesn't know who it is. Um, and it turns out to be the wand maker that made Crumb's wand and we know that Voldemort's after him now. Um, so it's just so interesting to literally see how many important things are happening at the borough, especially during the wedding. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And I think it's great that Victor inadvertently helped Harry out with his mission. Even though what's really funny is that Victor has no idea who he's talking to. <laughs> yeah. Here's more on the fabulous wedding. The cake had two phoenixes on top of it, which took flight when the cake was cut. And bottles of champagne floated unsupported through the crowd. Like, could I please have my wedding here? Like, that's all I want. So Harry eventually finds himself sitting with Alpheus Doge. And he is a member of the Order of the Phoenix and the one who wrote Dumbledore's obituary for the Daily Prophet. And Harry does reveal himself to Alpheus by letting him know, I'm Harry Potter. Um, so they talk about Dumbledore and... They talk about Rita Skeeter and her interview in The Prophet and everything, and it's clear that neither one of them are a fan of her, but wouldn't you know, Muriel comes over, who is a big fan of her, and reads her all the time. So Muriel sits down uninvited, she starts talking smack on Dumbledore, she goes off about Rita writing Dumbledore's biography, and how, you know, Dumbledore has a dark past and everything. She starts talking about Ariana and how she was a squib and everything. So, like, just super dark stuff coming from her. Um, she also mentions that Rita interviewed Bethilda Bagshot for this book. And she also reveals that the Dumbledores and Bethilda both lived in Godric's Hollow. And Harry has a moment of sadness here because he's like, wait... Dumbledore's family basically died in Godric's Hollow. My parents died in Godric's Hollow. Like, how do we not bond over this? So this is like an odd, awkward, sad moment for him. I think one of Harry's biggest faults is that he didn't get to know Dumbledore more. Like, Dumbledore was a fantastic person, and I wish I knew more about him through reading these books. Yeah, I agree, and it'd be really interesting to go into Dumbledore's character deeper sometime because... Some people think that Harry was only used as like a pawn in his game. He was very secretive. He only told Harry what he needed to know and that was it. And it was all for this end goal of defeating Voldemort. So yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to kind of look at Dumbledore's motives and see like how real his relationship with Harry really was. So around this point, Hermione comes over to Harry because she's tired of dancing and then Things go downhill. Kingsley Shacklebolt's Lynx Patronus flies in and lands in the middle of the dance floor. And it speaks in his voice and says, The ministry has fallen. Scrimger is dead. They are coming. So obviously, it takes a second for this to sink in. But then the wedding breaks out in chaos. There's spells flying all over the place. Harry and Hermione are together, but they can't find Ron. Eventually, they do find him and Hermione disapparates them away from the burrow. Luckily, she was prepared and packed everything that they needed in her beaded bag, which is pure genius. And they are gone from the burrow and their hunt for Horcruxes has begun. And that is the end of The Burrow in Deathly Hallows. 
This discussion was super interesting because we got to talk about the Weasleys, the best family ever, but it was also awesome to see how the tone of the book shifted and how this was reflected in the atmosphere at the borough. Because at the beginning in Chamber, it was all fun and everything, and now at the end in Deathly Hallows, after what we just talked about, so many things were planned there, it was darker, and despite just the part with the wedding, all the other parts were like Horcruxes and talking about what Dumbledore left in the will and all this tension and pressure and mad I dying and everything. Um, so it was super interesting to see the shift in the atmosphere and tension and yeah, I love having this discussion. When you read a book, you're more focused on the characters and the plot but you don't realize that this setting plays a huge role in this story. And if it wasn't for the burrow, a lot of things could have happened differently. Harry wouldn't have had a home with the Weasleys, and he really wouldn't be surrounded by his friends as much as he was in the books. It's really important for the development of his character, and it's also important to the plot. Because like we were saying, a lot of important conversations happen here, and without those conversations, events wouldn't have played out and moved forward like they did. I totally agree. And we hope you guys enjoyed coming to the borough with us this summer. If you have any thoughts about the borough, the Weasleys, or anything else, please share them with us. And we're super duper duper excited for a very special episode coming on July 31st. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you for coming back to Hogwarts with us in this episode of Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library podcast. Hedwood's theme and leaving Hogwarts in this episode were originally composed by John Williams and arranged by your favorite Hufflepuff. Until next time, three, two, one, Knox.